Hi there, I'm Eric Wordweaver Shervin, Go the Other Redgar Folk here in East Texas, and I'm your host. I'd like to welcome you to The Raven's Call. This is a show where I ramble on about different heathen-related subjects, just kind of whatever strikes my fancy at the time sets my mind on fire. So I, before we get started, let's talk a little bit about some housekeeping stuff. If you guys enjoy the videos, you like what you see, and you want to see more like them, please hit subscribe, ding the bell, interact with the videos. The more you do, uh, the more you share it around, the more subscribers we get, the more subscribers we get, the more out there it gets, the more interaction that the videos get, the more out there it gets, so we can kind of spread these around if you enjoy them. Now, big disclaimer before I start any of this stuff. Now, obviously, if you want to contact me or anything, it's all down below, including P.O. Box, all that other fun stuff. I do have a really cool thing that was sent in uh, by John. He knows who I'm talking about, and I intend to show it on the channel because it's freaking awesome, and I want to see it up on here. Uh, but the one that I shot it for, got that, that video did not turn out well, so I have to go back and reshoot it and include it, and all that's up at the office. I don't want to do all that out here uh, in, my, in my wilderness setting. So in the next one that I do in the office, hopefully, I'm going to try and get that one on there. So John knows what I'm talking about. The rest of you don't have a clue, but it'll be cool when you see it, I promise. Mm -hmm. So now, big UPG warning at the beginning of all of these. Everything that I do is my take on heathenry. Uh, I am a modern heathen. I am not a historic heathen. I am not what one would call a hardcore recon heathen. I call myself a modern heathen because I'm trying to find my way in the modern day um, in the eyes of the gods, my ancestors, and with my folk the spirits of the land around me. So that's, I don't really fall into the whole neo-pagan neo fluffy bunny side of things. I don't fall into the historical hardcore recon side of things, which you will see in a lot of, uh, a lot of different communities. Now let's move on to today's episode. Uh, as you've noticed, there's something a little different in the props that I'm using today. Uh, I do indeed have my baldric and my trusty blade on me today. Now, the reason for this, of course, is because I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of weapons within heathen ritual. Um, you know, we talk about all sorts of things within the context of culture, within the context of, you know, the ritual side of things, the spiritual side of things, and then we, we go back and forth a little bit on what these different things mean within relation to each other, etc., etc., etc. And there's some interesting key points that come up. Yep. Now, this video was born, a video idea was born out of me reading some stuff online uh, about some different conversations with regards to ferrous metals within ritual space and whether or not they had any place, whether or not it was advisable to include ferrous metals in your ritual space, or if that was somehow offensive to the ritual space, disruptive on a metaphysical level. I mean, there's a lot of different variables that go into whether or not uh, allowing ironworks or worked ironworked steel of any kind into a ritual space is appropriate. I go back and forth. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of support. I mean, we've talked some before in videos uh, about, you know, the influence of uh, metals within a ritual space and how you can use, uh, you know, wooden wooden weapons or wooden wooden items um, you know, obsidian, things like that, um, stone of different kinds. I know obsidian stone, but still, there's a myriad of different options available to you with regards to uh, weapon alternatives when it comes to the ritual space. But there's still some support for the use of weapons within a ritual space. And that's something that I wanted kind of to explore a little bit. If you look back at some of the uh, archaeological digs and things that we have, uh, you find that there are grave goods, there are ritual findings and ritual spaces that do include weapons, um, especially with regards to like sacrificed swords, axes, spears, things like that, that were ritually bent, especially the swords, where it's very evident that when they bend, they heat and bend the sword into an S shape, um, obviously this was sacrificed and made unusable in the material world. And so, in order to sacrifice a sword, a sword must be included within the ritual space and must be made sacrifice to the gods and goddesses. There's also uh, different warding techniques that can use um, weapons for different reasons. And this is something that I find particularly interesting because the idea of um, worked iron within a space, yes, uh, fey folk, hidden folk, don't particularly care for worked iron. Um, it makes it's offensive to them, uh, it's repulsive to them. They prefer the natural iron, not the worked iron. But <clears throat> the working of iron is the manifestation of the gifts that the gods have given us. We take 
everything that we have in our knowledge. We take uh, our knowledge of fire, we take our knowledge of metals, of the mechanics and the physics of our world, and we heat the metal and bend it into shape. We, we mix metals to make certain alloys, and the effect is that we create weapons. And uh, this is folk favor, by the way, the, the needle that binds a uh, spear for my tribe. Uh, this was actually a gift to me by our first chieftain when we formed Ridgar back in the day. Uh, to this day, <laughs> it binds the folk together uh, by being a, a common part of our games and festivals. So that is its role. It's less a war spear and more a spear of frith building. But anyway, um, you know, we take what the gods give us. We take our understanding of the world around us. We take our understanding of all the different skills, traits, of metals, alloys, and we create things that serve purposes. A manifestation of our will. When the gods created Midgard, they slew Ymir. And in slaying Ymir, they destroyed the first giant, the prima sacrifice, the first sacrifice, an act of violence, an act of violence that brought about the creation of everything that we know. We know we owe everything that we have to that primary first act of violence. So, that being said, there is, when we go through and we recreate mythic time and space for a ritual, when we're going through and we're talking about like a bloat, where sacrifice is made to the gods, what we are actually doing is we are tapping into and we are recreating uh, that prima sacrifice. We are stepping into the role of that prima sacrifice and we are there with them. We are entering that sacred time, sacred space within our ritual circle, within our ritual area, whatever it may be, square, circle, whatever, I don't care. Um, but the gist is that within the boundaries of the worked space, we begin to <sighs> blur the boundaries between the profane and the sacred. It is a place where both exist in the same time and same space, which is the only time that's possible uh, is in ritual like that. Now, some would say that the presence of worked iron, worked steel of any kind, within that ritual space would be disruptive to it and ultimately prevent the connection being made. I have not had this experience personally. I still feel like the connections have been made and that I have gotten where I needed to uh, with the presence of certain ritual items. Now, that being said, uh, this is not a ritual axe. I'm not going to take this ritual axe into uh, my ritual space. Now, it is a ritual ritualized acts in that we use it in our games for our festivals. So this one has a purpose, a specific purpose, and it gets busted out for that purpose. This is not a splitting axe. This is not an axe that I use to go hunting. Uh, this is an axe that I use for frith building. So that is its purpose, just like the spear, uh, Folkweaver. Although Folkweaver has been hunting with me before. We, we used to do some a bit of spear hunting back in the day. And so uh, she, has, she has been out in the fields with me on a hunt. And uh, she's great. I love her. So, but for instance, the sword that I have at my side, I know some of you are dying to see it. Trust me, don't get too excited. It's just some flash and trash back from my Ren Fair days. It's nothing too exciting. Um, this is a standard Viking sword. Uh, nothing, nothing major to it. Uh, matter of fact, I think this is, it's made in China out of stainless steel. It's not a good blade, not by any chance, not by any means. Uh, if you want real steel, go to a blacksmith and get the good stuff. I just can't afford the good stuff right now. Uh, and I will one day be spending some serious cash on a decent blade uh, for ritual purposes. But this is just for show today, which is fine, because that's all the blade's good for is show. Now, this is not something that I use in ritual very often, but it is something that can have a place within a ritual context with regards to going through and setting boundaries, wards, etc, etc, etc. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that I would carry my sword into the actual ritual itself. The reason for that being, um, this is an act, this is, this is a weapon of war. <laughs> this is not a weapon of harvest. This is not a, a, a tool of building or creation or anything like that. The thing about the hammer uh, with Thor is that that is, that's a multi-purpose item. You know, the hammer both builds and destroys. Uh, now, within Thor's context, it is a war hammer, and it's meant for destruction specifically. Uh, but the stories also say that by striking the hammer on the ground, Thor revives his goats, and they return to the living. Uh, it's from Thor's journey to Utgard-Loki. 
And uh, so there is a creative, a resurrecting force. If you look at uh, Thrymskvida, when uh, Thor goes out, and uh, I think it's Thrymskvida, um, where Thor gets the hammer stolen, and uh, he has to go and dress up as Freya and everything and bring the, fo- bring the hammer back. Um, Mjolnir is used in the original text as something of a blessing at that point, laid on the lap of the bride in order to bless the union with fertility. So Thor's hammer has multiple purposes. It's not just a creation of destruction, whereas, say, a sword uh, is meant for that purpose. Um, You're not going to use this to go splitting wood or anything like this. This is step into combat and take things out. Now, yes, I know, I'm touching the blade. You're not supposed to touch the blade, but that's fine. I'm going to go through and clean her later anyway. She's she's desperately in need of it, and uh, her edge is meh. So anyway, the gist here is that I find that there is a place for certain weapons and certain roles within ritual, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to walk into ritual with everything on. Um, Like this baldric and everything, I probably would not wear this into ritual itself. The reason being is that I do not find that the purpose of the sword jives with everything that I'm trying to do uh, with ritual. So I like to keep bladed weapons typically out of my ritual circle for the most part, unless they're actually dedicated to the ritual itself. Now I keep along different ritualized blades. You know, it can be anything from a simple knife like this uh, to more of the (coughs) hand-wrought, hand-hammered, this is a railroad spike knife, obviously. Uh, Shout out to my old drum crew. Uh, This is the Yulsuvi blade, which only those with the old Sylvie will know. Everybody else will be like, huh? Anyway, um, neither of these are ones that I use for ritual purposes because those are all in yonder, and uh, I try to keep those away from, you know, they don't need to be on the channel and everything. That's that's my personal stuff. But anyway, uh, it's just examples of different things. Like, we talked about the axes and stuff before. What I like to do is I like to keep something around that I can use to harvest blotains. Uh, like, if I'm going to go through off of um, one of my cedars or my pines or something and harvest a blotain, a little sprig of nettles in order to spray the blessing during one of our rituals, then I would like to use a ritualized knife for that purpose so that it is imbued with the purpose of why. The why is important in it. And that's the big thing with all of this. The presence of weapons of any kind within a ritual space is all about the why. Um, I would not bring in my throwing axes into a ritual space because it doesn't really serve a purpose. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't really connect us better with the gods or anything like that. Yeah, they're cool and everything. They're great for the festival outside, but not necessarily right for being within a ritual space, right? Um, the sword. Love the sword like to keep my sword on me uh, for fun and games, but, you know, I will wear it when I'm out here and about during the festival as a kind of symbol of everything within the the role that I play within the tribe. Not that I do that very often. I don't think I've ever actually brought this one out in the current incarnation of the tribe. This is old school. But anyway, um, most of the time what I do carry on me is indeed my sidearm, my judge, uh, which is ultimately for protection because we are out here in the middle of nowhere and you never know when you're going to come across snakes or varmints or anything like that. Plus, if I'm going to gather my folk together, I need to have a purpose, a, a means by which to protect them. And so that's why usually when we have everybody together, I keep my peace on me whenever I'm out and uh, out on the site and, you know, doing our festival stuff. However, I always set it aside before I enter my ritual space. Because again, that's not a ritual item. That's not an item that's dedicated to ritual purposes. That's That seems to be the big disconnect there, uh, is the purpose of the item, the reason for its existence. As long as the item itself is purposed towards ritual, say a blade that's meant to be the sacrificial blade for uh, whatever offering that you're going to be giving. Say if you have a sax blade around that you use to uh, to carve up your sacrifices, to uh, chop up the different items you may use to represent Emir in the Rite of Return, etc., etc., etc. You know, that kind of thing I have had good results with having in a ritual space. That is worked metal. It's still there. So I don't necessarily have a problem with that in that kind of a setting. Now, my pocket knife, which is decidedly less than what I have dealing with as far as a ritual item goes, uh, I leave that out because I'm not going to, to bring that in there and I try to let keep other people to keep those kind of things out of there. Uh, it all boils down to the why as, as most things, you know? Now, 
Folkweaver here has been utilized in ritual before. Um, usually in the warding process, the demarcation of a working space and the setting of boundaries between the in and out. Uh, the, the walls of the well, as it were. So uh, she has been used to demarcate uh, boundaries before, and I have used her in some specific rituals tied to Olden. Um, but that was for that dedicated purpose, and Falkfever is not your normal spear. I wouldn't necessarily take just any spear that I had in there uh, for the purposes of going through and, and doing a ritual, you know, as far as uh, if I was going to use it as a symbol for Olden, or if I was going to use it to uh, m mimic one of the sacrifices from an Odinic standpoint. It would have to be a pretty special spear that's meant for that purpose, or at least it does double duty in that respect. But still, uh, it's respect to the spirit of the spear itself, and yeah, that's important to me. So anyway, there's another aspect to weapons uh, within a ritual space that we haven't talked about yet, and that is the idea of blessing the weapons. Uh, we used to, uh, back when we were doing a lot of hunting, and which I hope to do again here <laughs> in the near future, uh, during the harvest season, uh, the harvest in the south can sometimes, especially in this modern day, look a little bit different in that we can go out and we can harvest from the land in the form of uh, our, our hunting kills. And so it's not unusual to go through and bless the weapons as the tools of the hunt. Uh, especially, I like to do that around winter nights, uh, Freyfaxy kind of stuff, uh, for the purposes of blessing them with luck, um, the smiles of our ancestors, the, the will of the gods, as it were, uh, to help us provide for our people, to make sure that our harvest is good and strong, etc., etc., etc. I know different people that do this with firearms, with bows and arrows, with spears. Um, we have done multiple over the years. It just depends on the year and what's going on. And then sometimes we don't if it's not a hunting year for us or whatever. Um, it varies. It depends. It, it entirely depends on the situation. But this is an example of how weapons could be present within a ritual space. So let's talk about why you wouldn't bring a weapon into a ritual space real quick. Uh, that's that's going to be the whole, you know, Viking Brosatru kind of, hey, I'm cool, die in battle, go to Valhalla kind of guys that just want to feel cool carrying a weapon into a, into a ritual space. I mean, we're talking about bringing in an item that is not not secured, as it were. Um, you know, these, these ritual items that are there for a purpose, either there to be blessed or that are there as a part of the ritual itself, they have a purpose. They have a reason to be there. They're secured, as it were. And so you want to see these things um, in the space that they're supposed to be in, responsibly handled, and they're usually key to a ritual in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Um, just wearing in, like, I wouldn't wear my sword in there, like I said before, because, well, yes, it's cool, and yes, I keep it around as kind of a symbol and everything. There's no place for it in the ritual. And one, it would just kind of get in the way of things to a certain extent. But also, um, that that would be kind of offensive to the gods. I mean, I'm coming in to a space where we are sharing this space with the sacred. You know, we are, we're stepping into that sacred space, and... There's nothing we could do to harm the gods. I mean, the gods are so far beyond us that uh, it's not that having the weapon or not is not going to be a betrayal to the gods because we can't. It doesn't mean it doesn't do anything, but it is a symbol of reverence and deference. If you're going to, it's like going before the king and bowing. Yes, you could walk up and shake the king's hand and look him in the eye, and no, that's not going to necessarily hurt him, harm him in any way. But it is disrespectful. And that's really what it boils down to for me in this respect, is that bringing in unnecessary weapons is disrespectful to the gods and goddesses. It can actually be offensive to them because you come in without showing them due reverence, without showing them due respect. And so they will take offense to it, and sometimes it can tarnish or even ruin a ritual. Uh, you can bring the ire of the gods on yourself through that route. And so I highly recommend, unless it is a weapon that is specifically purposed for ritual, something that is set aside specifically for the purpose of that ritual, 
And whether that's temporarily purposed for that or permanently purposed for that, I don't recommend bringing a weapon into ritual unless it is the subject of the ritual, like either the sacrifice itself or to be blessed by the ritual itself. Both of those are means that the weapon could enter this, the ritual space, but it's coming as a participant of the ritual. There is a reason for it to be there. There's a why for it to be there. And uh, not not just for fun, you know, uh, not for giggles and things like that. Um, I do not recommend bringing in your, your big Viking metal axe or whatever, or, uh, you know, standing around leaning on your spear in ritual circle because you're at the ready, and that's not, that's not, the ritual space is not for that. Now, if the ritual leader is utilizing the spear as a form of tool within the ritual space, then that's one thing. Uh, but for the general practitioner, mm, it's ill-advised. I wouldn't do that. Um, and if you're doing any kind of work with the vates here, that's a different ball game entirely because you're not talking about sacred space, profane space. You're talking about trying to entreat spiritual entities within the spiritual space and the physical space. So, like out here, I wouldn't try to do work with the Vatir and then be working with and wearing a whole bunch of metals because they're going to reject that. They're going to want to get away from that. It's going to be uh, tarnishing and damaging to them. So, we don't want to do that. We don't want to go that route. So, we're going to you know, do not going to wear the weapons, not going to wear these things. Um, I will usually try and tone down the worked metals in general, uh, just so as to, you know, make things more palatable for them. I try to work more with stones and woods and things like that. So, and I know I've gone back and forth with the talk on the weapons and everything in the ritual space, the presence of metals in there uh, before. Um, but I find that there is an important distinction between working with the spiritual and working with the sacred because the symbolisms are different, the scopes of things are different, and what you're trying to do is different. Uh, when we're trying to entreat with the gods, uh, they're so far beyond us that we are trying to, to, we're a peasant trying to gain the, you know, attention of the king, as it were. Um, when we're dealing with the Vaitir, we're talking about tribes of men and tribes of the unseen tribes of the, the Vaitir, uh trying to interact with one another. <laughs> and so uh, it's more on an equal terms kind of thing. Although we're not necessarily on equal terms, it's going to be a difference in who has what capacity, etc., etc., etc. So, eh, you know, um, the, the differences are different. You still want to show respect. You still want to respect boundaries, uh, respect... You, know, you don't want to come in seeming aggressive, etc., 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 but you also don't want to, you know, try and think of interacting with the Vaitir in the same way that you're interacting with the gods. You actually have more in common with the gods than you do with the Vaitir in a lot of ways, except on the Pharaoh element of the soul, etc., etc., etc. That's a subject for a different day. So, anyway, so, yeah, that's a lot of roundabout stuff to say. The idea of weapons in a ritual space is all about the why for me. Same thing as it is with everything else. So if your purpose for having them there is so that you can utilize them within the ritual, either as a participant in the form of an item being blessed by the ritual, or as a tool within the ritual itself to help ensure its success, then that makes sense. That That's proper. That should be there. Now, if it's to be cool, if it's to be like, oh, Viking and stuff, and it's all about aesthetic or anything like that, then no, I, I would not recommend that. I, I absolutely would not recommend that. Now, if you have an issue with, per se, uh, safety, and you feel like you need security for your people, um, I would say you're probably not doing your ritual in a good space then. You probably need to be in a space where you feel safe, because if you're not able to let your guard down enough uh, to not need an armed guard at that exact moment, if you feel like you have an armed guard all of the time, then you're probably not working in a secure enough environment uh, to be able to hold an effective ritual and actually get something done. Now, if it's an emergency situation and you're trying to pull something off, then work with what you got. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, if you're like armed military and you're trying to do something on the fly out there in the middle of mm, and yeah okay <laughs> different story 
I get it. Work with what you've got, you know. Real quick interjection, guys. This is something that came to me while I was editing all of this, and I had to throw this in there, that uh, when it comes to weapons in Ritual, uh, when you're talking about something like the warrior cult, like I just mentioned the whole uh, armed forces trying to pull something together on the fly, when you're talking about warrior cult, which is in and of itself a separate culture from the basic tribal culture, it is a part of that culture, but it is its own kind of uh, microcosm in and of itself. They'll have different traditions, they'll have different uh, rituals, things like that, different focuses. That's going to take on a different kind of life. You know, the video that we're talking about here is more for the generalized tribal interactions as opposed to, say, warrior cult kind of stuff. We'll do some more on warrior cult stuff in the future, uh, but that's uh, that that's an area that I think I may need to get some outside influence from because I know a guy who works specifically with warrior cult stuff, and I think it would be very beneficial. But in, in the meantime, guys, just understand that when I mention that, yes, I understand weapons are going to take a very different role in the warrior cult. Regardless, whatever your situation is, you always have to work within the confines of what you have available to you. Um, a lot of people aren't going to have any kind of access to weapons at all, so this whole conversation is a moot point to them. It's like, uh, why? I don't need it. I don't want it. I'm not playing dress up. I'm not having... And that's right. You're not playing dress up. We're going through and we are doing rituals. We are uh, honoring the gods and goddesses. We are honoring our ancestors. We're honoring the Vatir. So, that's why the inclusion of weapons in those kind of things needs to be purposeful if it's going to be at all. It is not essential for the most part. You do probably need some kind of cutting implement as a tool uh, for ritual purposes, just as a pragmatic standpoint. Um, there are great rituals that you can do utilizing different weapon elements, uh, special, especially some spear imagery for working with old one eye. Uh, but it's not necessary, not by any means. You don't have to feel like you've got to go out and collect a bunch of medieval weapons in order to be heathen. No, that's that's more along the bros are true. Hey, let's play dress up and be Viking uh, kind of thing. Unless, of course, you're into something like the SCA, where uh, that is something that they do as a specific hobby, is go through and, and do a lot of historically accurate recreations of costumes and weapons, etc., etc., etc. Still doesn't mean that carrying that spear into the ritual space is the right call, though. Know what I mean? You know, you can... Uh, and we'll talk about ritual garb in another video at another time, uh, if that's something you guys are interested in, because there's a whole slew of things you can talk about with regards to ritual garb. Um, if I haven't already done that, I need to go back and look at my my list and make sure that I haven't done a breakdown on ritual garb before. Uh, if I have, then disregard that. Don't worry about it. So, all in all... The whole gist of this is just the why and the purpose. So, thank you guys for watching all the way through this. I hope that this rambly bits kind of made some sense. It wasn't just, you know, to have an excuse to wave pieces of metal in front of the screen. Um, genuinely speaking, as we build our rituals, as we go forward, people need to think about these things. And I have to go back and think about things that I made either rookie mistakes on in the beginning or that I have developed an idea of over time, but may not necessarily have made sense to a rookie. Uh, back in the day, like, I went through a period of time there where I was like, no weapons whatsoever in the ritual space, blah, blah, blah. And then some more applied thought going on, and it's like, mm, no, no, there are some specific purposes, some specific reasons, and spe some specific callings as to uh, when and how that might be appropriate. And so, but I, with that, I also gained a, a more generalized, nuanced approach to things. Um, I know a lot of guys who will be specific about when dealing with Freud, of uh, not allowing swords into, or any kind of work metal, any kind of weapons into a, uh, a temple or ritual space dedicated to Frey, or that you're working with Frey, Frey, to a bunch of others. Um, the EY does the Ui sound in Old Norse. So, yeah, Frey. <coughs> this is all based off of the mythological parity with uh, Frey sacrificing his blade that said to fight Jotun on its own. So so magical, so wonderful, that uh, he needs it in the final battle of Ragnarok in order to survive, uh, because it will fight alongside him on its own. An uh, automated kind of deal. Uh, so his sacrificing that to get Gerd, his, uh, his wife, uh, the maid of the bride arms, the giantess, um, in order to gain her, he sacrifices this sword gives it away, so he doesn't have it anymore. And as a result, he fights in the final battle with a stag's antler, as he fights certain 
And so a lot of people will use that as a basis to say, you know, no weapons in Freud's temple, etc., etc., etc. And there are some some references in the past about not allowing weapons specifically within Freud's temple. <sighs> is that specifically about that particular mythical parody, or is that simply about not offending the gods by bringing weapons of war into a place of peace kind of thing, uh, an area where you are sublimating yourself, supplicating yourself to the gods? That, that that's not a place to bring weapons of war. Now, a weapon that is meant to be used in a ritual is a weapon of ritual. That is a tool of ritual at that point. It's not even necessarily a weapon uh, because it's not used for the weapon purpose. It ceases to be a weapon and becomes a tool. Um, so then it becomes more a conversation about the existence of ferrous metals within a ritual space and whether on a metaphysical level that is disruptive to the energies at play. That's a back and forth thing because metals do channel a lot of energy. They do handle a lot of energy and retain a great deal of energy. Uh, wonderful conduits. As such, I find them to be extremely effective in use in ritual. Um, less, uh, they're less disruptive and more effective if used appropriately and channeled appropriately. If they are there but not utilized and not handled appropriately, then it does create weird currents in what you're trying to do and will just disrupt everything. That's why I like to keep the the worked metals in the space to a minimum. Like somebody has their keys in their pocket, I'm not going to care about that. But if somebody's walking around with a sword, that's going to redirect some energies. And that's going to be difficult for me to handle as a goalie uh, when I'm working with the energies of a space to you know be able to to can get a handle on that, control some of that situation. It's going to throw things out of whack, and it's going to bring in its own energies that I don't necessarily want to be part of the ritual circle. Does that make sense? Anyway, um, that's enough for today. We're going to come back to stuff like this later. If you guys are interested, uh, we'll see. So thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it. Hail to you all. May your hearth fires burn bright. Oh, it's working. Cool. <laughs> so weird. I'm used to having my microphone on the other side. I hope this works. Pardon the noise, guys. I need to pinch that down. Okay. A little pre-show preparation. Ah, fun and games. One of my viewers, Jared, will get a kick out of this. He'll remember these. The old sous vide knives from back in the day. It's from my old drum group. Freaking love them. Perfect for popping the tops off of stuff and for just about anything else that you can imagine. Uh, <laughs> the white on there is from drywall, I think was the last thing that I had to punch through with it. I don't remember. Anyway, all kinds of stuff. So, that's going to be a point of conversation here in a little bit. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Of course, uh, you know, beverage of choice. Guinness Extra Chow to do without. Got to love it. All right. <laughs> We're going to see how this goes, and then, of course, the uh, the smoke for afterwards while I'm editing. Ha ha ha. Cinco Vega uh, Series A, if anyone is curious as to what the smoke is. Uh, that's the editing smoke. My uh, evening smoke later will be the Drew Estates Undercrown, which is one of my favorites. All right. I think we're situated. This is obviously going to be the weapons and ritual uh, episode. So, <laughs> if that's not already blatantly obvious. So, um, no, I don't necessarily want that. It's fine. All right, we're good. And we're live in three, two, one. Let's jam. Uh, mm, that's a horrible intro. Scrap it. Rewind. Do it over again. And <clears throat> we're live in three, two, one. Let's jam. Yeah, now this is back from my days in the Renaissance Festival, uh, carrying the baldric and my trusty blade around with me all the time. Now this, of course, is not a this is not a good blade. This is not a real one. Uh, this is just a little flash and trash, as we call it in the industry. Uh, it, it's not even a full tang. <coughs> the blade itself is like stainless steel. <laughs> it's not even good spring steel. You know, it, it would not hold up in combat. Now, don't get me wrong; it would do the job, but it's not. Uh, it's not what you're looking for when you're talking about a good blade. But uh, this is a subject matter that I want to discuss today. We're talking about weapons with regards to ritual. Let's not do that. 
I recut that because it feels weird. All right. Set these things up where they're easily accessible. Let's try this again. All right, cut. Go back to the start of today's episode. Ready? And three, two, one. Let's jam. Tool battle. <laughs> I love my sword. Anyway. Yep. Love my sword. It's cheap, I know. Useless, but it's all for show. It's just a fun thing. It's more a toy than anything else. All right, onwards and upwards.